this is a, a magnificent stage, and that's what it is today. Behind us, the Sharon Temple, completed in 1832 and built for Solomon's Temple as described in the New Jerusalem in Revelations 21. But here in Upper Canada, that building represented the hopes and the aspirations of the children of peace. And behind me, the home of the master builder, Ebenezer Doan, completed in 1819. And with all the architectural influences that were brought with him, both Germanic and British, brought with him from the Pennsylvania frontier. This house is 200 years old this year, a wood frame house meticulously cared for, but just the same. Isn't it amazing? What we're doing today is something that's never really been done here before. Well, it hasn't been done here before. It's an interview with a dead man. I really don't know how it's going to go, <laughs> but know that it is 100% historically accurate. Ebenezer Doan, died in this house on February 3rd, 1866. And I'd like to invite Claire Mahoney to come to read uh, a eulogy that was written for Ebenezer Doan on that day. At his residence near Sharon, after a short illness, Ebenezer Doan, aged 93 years, 4 months, and 24 days, being the last of six brothers, whose age is united with that of their father, amounts to 574 years and a few months. He was a native of Bucks County, Pennsylvania, and a member of the Society of Friends. He emigrated to Canada in the year 1808 and settled on Young Street. He, being one of the first settlers, he had with them to suffer all the privations consequent upon their lot. In the year 1818, he moved to his residence near Sharon, where he has since lived up to the time of his death. His end was peace. He leaves an aged widow, seven children, and a large circle of relations and friends to mourn for his loss, written by Anonymous. Author unknown, but a, a testament to who he was. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Are you Ebenezer Doan? I am. Of Bucks County, Pennsylvania? I am. Of, more lately of the village of Hope and Sharon? That's correct. There are, there are some relations here today who would like to speak with you. Will you join us? I guess I could make some time. Please come. This is a microphone. Just speak, a, speak into the end so that they all can hear. Okay, we'll see what we can do. Mr. Doan, who, who are you and where do your people come from? Well, I was born in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. I uh, grew up there. In our family, we uh, seem to have a, an affinity for for building. And my brother John, my brother John and I uh, apprenticed with our older brother Jonathan for several years. We worked on. Uh, many of the notable buildings for the day, uh, particularly the New Jersey State House and the State Prison in New Jersey, to name a, a couple. In the winter, why I was home uh, with my family and bucks and did a little farming and raised a little livestock. You went to Georgia. You went to Savannah. Why? 
Well, it might have been seeking adventure. I was a young man, also looking for work. While there, I met uh, a young lady by the name of Sebra Fry, and in 1795, we married. Unfortunately, a year later, she passed and I returned home to Bucks County. We're sorry for your loss. Thank you. But you did marry a second time when you came back to Bucks County. Tell me about her. I did. Uh, I met Elizabeth Stockton. She was just 18 when we married. She was a very handsome woman with a dark hair and pleasing personality, and we were married for 65 years. 65 years? Yes. Life expectancy was 40. How many children did you have? We uh, had seven children, uh, five boys and two girls, uh, Abraham, Eliza, not Eliza. Elias. Elias. Is it Elias? Yes, Elias. I can never think of that boy's name. He did pretty well. <laughs> and then there was Ira and Oliver. And the youngest was David, and the, the girls were Hannah and Sarah. Did you not lose any children in, in infancy? I know that uh, a lot of children died at childbirth and in their younger years. But Elizabeth and I were very fortunate that uh, by the grace of God, we saw all of our children grow up. Why did you leave Bucks County? I might add that our children provided us with 41 grandchildren. Wow, and many more after that. <laughs> You're right. Why did you leave? We left Bucks County uh, partly because it was, it was difficult in the United States at this time. Uh, if you hadn't participated in the War of Independence, uh, which friends did not. The feeling ran against you, but perhaps more than that, we came looking for land. Uh, Bucks County was becoming very populated, so here we hoped to find room for our families to grow and, and uh, uh, find land and be able to uh, set up farming. We also were promised freedom to uh, worship in our own way. We were promised freedom, exemption from military service, freedom from taxes, these type of things. We'll come back to those things in a moment. The trip though, tell me about that journey. Uh, well, it was a long one. I estimated it was about 550 miles. And uh, we left Bucks County on the fourth day of the fourth month, 1808. And we joined the New Market meeting on the 13th day of the seventh month. We uh, traveled with wagons covered with canvas in which we stored most of our furnishings and supplies that we would need to start anew. The men uh, walked a good bit of the way. Uh, we had oxen pulling the wagons. And oxen aren't particularly good at being driven, particularly when they don't know 
where they're going. So they had to be led a good bit of the way, which meant walking with them. So you departed from where, Wrightstown? We left Wrightstown and crossed the Allegheny Mountains, came up to uh, that great lake, Ontario. We crossed over the river there into Upper Canada. The women and children by this time were very tired. We'd been on the road a long time. So we hired a boat and uh, we, we sent them across the lake to shorten their trip. But we were another 10 days coming around the western end of the lake. What were the conditions like on the way? For instance, where did you sleep? Well, conditions weren't very good because in many places the, the roads were almost non-existent. And when it rained, and it did rain, they turned into a sea of mud, made the trip very slow, but also because some of us had to sleep on the ground because there was no room in the wagons for everyone and sleeping on the wet ground uh, made it kind of miserable. What about money? I had a little concern for money. I didn't know how much I was going to need to set up, buy a, a farm and establish myself. And I would left Bucks with a considerable amount of money owing to me. But my good friend Aaron Eastman, uh, over the next while, collected most of that money and sent it to me, so it, it worked out. And when you arrived, what did you find? What were the conditions in Upper Canada? Well, a lot of the country was covered by dense bush, uh, mixed bush of softwoods and hardwoods. And here and there, there had been places cleared for farming. There was lots of game to put food on the table. And when you cleared the trees and got rid of the stumps, which was backbreaking work, you found the topsoil was very deep and very rich and produced excellent crops. How did you acquire the property and what and how did you establish yourself? Well, we were not without financial means, so we purchased our farm on Young Street and the same when we moved to East Gwellenberry. Which was which year? Uh, 1813. 13. What did you grow then on this this deep rich soil and how many acres did you acquire? Well, first we grew buckwheat and peas, the same as we'd done back home. But we soon found that when we came to sell buckwheat, why there wasn't a big market for it here. It wasn't widely used. So by the time we moved to East Gwillenberry, wheat was our major money crop. On Young Street, we, uh, we had 100 acres. When I moved up here to East Gwillenberry, I bought 250 acres, but I only ever really worked about 50 of it myself. And at one time, I actually owned 400 acres. 400, that, that's a lot of property for 1813, 1818. I suppose, uh, and when I think about it, I was the largest landowner in East Wilmbury at the time. Congratulations. Thank you. Describe your daily routine. Well, just a lot of work. We started at half four in the morning worked until supper time and then there was usually meetings to go to 
in the evening. In the winter, we weren't quite as busy, but we cut a lot of timber and uh, had it sawn and planed into boards because I built this house in 1819 and my shed and shop over there in 1818 and the same for the granary and of course then we started construction of the first meeting house for the children of peace and the temple and the David study. So we were, we were very busy. What about the children? Were they educated? Our children, uh, Elizabeth and I saw to it, our children were all educated, including the girls. Girls were not normally educated those days, but we felt it necessary. Was that a Quaker principle or a, a, a family belief? Well, I'd have to say that I probably believed in it, but it was also one of the principles of the children of peace. Sounds peaceful, if uh, laborious. How did things change uh, in the War of 1812 with the United States? Well, of course, everything that the British had promised us uh, sort of went away. Uh, they uh, tried to conscript our young people, and those that they couldn't conscript, they taxed. And if you didn't pay the tax, they simply stole your crops and your livestock. What do you mean, stole? Well, I don't suppose that the British regulars looked at it as stealing. They were only collecting the taxes they felt were owed. But they took our goods anyway. What penalty did you face for refusing to fight? Well, many of the young friends were uh, uh, imprisoned for refusing to fight. Uh, my brother John, between 1807 and 1813, paid $313 in taxes. Uh, Sam Hughes paid the same. I got away with a little less. But in 1813, there were something like 20 horses taken off the farms out on Young Street for mil military service, which really made things difficult for us. John's levy of 313 in today's dollars would be about $5,500 in fine. How and why did you become involved in the Children of Peace? Well, the first time I met David Wilson at a, at a meeting, I found him to be a very charismatic individual. He, he drew you to him, and you could tell that he had the, the inner light within him. They told me that he was born a Presbyterian, but he sounded more like the Quakers of olden days. So when he left in 1812, my family felt that his philosophies and his beliefs were very much akin to ours. So we decided to come with him. What was his, his message that caused your family to want to follow him up here? Well, he believed in in working together to support one another. He believed that that God should be our leader. Would you describe yourself as devout? 
I was raised in a quake, quite a strict Quaker family. And yes, I believe that the answers are with God. So, in erecting the temple then, the shrine to these beliefs, what, what were the challenges in erecting this structure? Well, uh, David had certain ideas about what should be encompassed in it. He and I worked together to make those ideas become a reality. David was a, a sort of a a carpenter, but not of the skills required to build something like this. And that was one of the biggest problems that I faced. There was only my brother John and myself that really had the construction skills to build something like this, which uh, this many things in this building uh, were new to this area. How long did it take to build it? It took six years to build the temple itself. So let's, you know, let's ask guests to have a, a look over there. What was it about this design that was new to Upper Canada? Well, I think primarily the way the second and the third story do not sit on the walls of the first floor. It required quite a unique uh, method of construction to achieve that. Is this fact or fiction that you didn't use nails? <laughs> Makes you wonder how these stories get started. There are thousands of nails in the temple. <laughs> the siding and the trim is all held on with nails. The uh, the frame is put together with mortise and tendon, so there's not nails there. And my brother John, when he built the ark, uh, used no nails, he used pegs of wood. What is the ark? Well, it's, David wanted it patterned after the uh, ark of the covenant of the Old Testament, and as it contained the commandments of God, so does this ark contain the commandments. How long did it take to build the ark? It was a year, and my brother was a year in constructing it. Hence, most people say that it took seven years to build the temple. So the, the temple has I noticed a door on all sides, all four sides. Why is that? Why is there not one grand entry? Well, that was one of the uh, fundamental principles of the temple. It was equality so that people could come from equal foot on equal footing from any direction to the temple. However, uh, the south and the east doors were the ones used most of the time. Unlike the Quakers, the children had music and songs. Uh, did you sing popular hymns that we would know? In the temple, uh, David wrote lyrics to popular tunes of the day, hymns. And every time that that hymn was used in the temple, he wrote different lyrics. You only sang hymns that were written by David Wilson? In the temple we did, yes. In the meeting house, that was different. Right. What do you think about when you look at the temple now? Well, it's a little sad, I guess. Uh, to see it there and realize that the vision that David had for it 
and what it was projected to become died with him and uh, no one carried on after him. And yet the building still stands? The building still stands and uh, people have taken great care of it, just like this house. They've taken great care of these two properties. Why, Elizabeth and I could move right back into this house. And the temple sits there ready to welcome the band of the children of peace and, and the congregation to raise their voices in songs of praise to our God. You contracted a serious illness. What happened? In the first month of uh, 1849, I got very ill and took to my bed. And I was there nearly three months. Uh, a doctor, Agar, from Holland Landing uh, visited me nearly 25 times, so Elizabeth told me. He brought me tonics and cough medicine and quinine. When I recovered, I found I owed him quite a sum of money, which took me several months to finally settle, but I did. Did you said quinine? Did the doctor know what this was? This illness? I don't think so. At least he never said to me. Mm -hmm. All he did was get me through it. Um, I want to suggest, and I understand, um, Ebenezer, you might not know what I'm uh, asking. Were you troubled by mosquitoes around here? <laughs> well, uh, hot weather, we always had mosquitoes, but. They were nothing more than a nuisance. They were somewhat, a note to the audience, they were somewhat more of a nuisance. Between the 1780s and the 1840s, uh, many, many newcomers to Canada got malaria. It killed uh, a good number of the 1,000 people who lost their lives building the Rideau Canal around the same time as the Sharon Temple was under construction. Then, of course, it was known only as a fever or an ague, and people believed that it was caused by swamp gas. But not until 1897 did a British scientist named Sir Ronald Ross discover that malaria was a parasite uh, transmitted by the female Anopheles mosquito. And the treatment then was quinine. Let's, let's turn from uh, parasites to politics. Is there a difference? <laughs> Did you ever meet the publisher and political leader, William Lyon Mackenzie? Yes, Mr. Mackenzie came uh, here several times while we were building the temple and, and afterwards. Uh, he wrote uh, in his newspaper about the temple. He wrote in the Colonial Advocate that it was calculated to inspire the beholder with astonishment. And I felt that was a, a fitting description of the temple. He uh, was a great friend of David Wilson's. The two of them had one thing in common. They both could preach different audiences, of course, but they could draw people to themselves. Describe Mackenzie. Well, he was uh, a very rabble-rousing type of a speaker. Not a particularly handsome man. He had flaming red hair and a pinched face. And I must say I didn't agree with much of what he said about how we could accomplish a just society. What? was it you didn't agree with? Well, he was advocating getting rid of the governor that was serving our Majesty Queen Victoria. 
I didn't believe that we should be involved in those kind of things. Was it the involvement in a force or the removal of the governor that you most objected to? Well, I think both. Uh, we were all loyal subjects to the, to the Queen. The problems that were here, I believe, were created by the governor. Members of your family did become involved in Mackenzie's Rebellion of 1837. Did you condone that? Uh, no, uh, and none of my immediate family became involved. My brother John's boys, Jesse and Charles, did, and thankfully they returned home fairly unscathed for their actions. Uh, Jesse and Charles were imprisoned, yeah. When, and other several other Dons as well, right? From the yes. I want to show you something. What What is this? Well, that's one of those little boxes that the prisoners carved to pass the time while they were waiting their time in jail. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a message. There's a message on the side of it. Could you read it for us? Paint this is a painted on. Tyranny, their fetters forged in vain to crush thy spirit. Liberty, like brittle glass, shall break the chain of those that would be free. But you left the children of peace. Why? I did. Uh, in 1840, I, I wrote a letter to David, and I'm sure he was very disappointed that, as was I, to leave. But I think I'll keep my own counsel on anything else on the matter. What about Elizabeth and the children? Did they leave? No, they remained as members of the Children of Peace. But you left? But I went back to the Quakers. Was your decision connected in any way to the rebellion? I didn't feel that uh, civil disobedience was the way to achieve social justice. Uh, I, th I believe that we were to follow the path that God has laid out for us. All answers are with him. The Dones demonstrably resettled the family under pioneering circumstances three times from Massachusetts, where they arrived in 1630, then to Pennsylvania, Bucks County, and then again to Upper Canada. What was the family searching for? Well, my great grandfather Daniel became a Quaker when he lived in Massachusetts. But there was a greater number of the friends living in Pennsylvania, and land was somewhat cheaper. So I would think that he probably went there to join that community, to live in that community. For us coming here, we came looking for a better way of life. A place to raise our children. So reflecting now, how do you think it turned out? Well, I was taught a way of life when I was growing up. But the world changed greatly in my lifetime. I lived so long. And I didn't pass that on to my children. Farming practices have improved, machinery improved, and I don't think I equip, equip them for the future. I did, 
leave them all my children well cared for when I passed, but only one of them really uh, became financially successful. Which one was that? Ira, he was the one that seemed to have the business head that I had. Abraham, he had the values, the charitable values that I had tried to instill in my children. And he was the one who carried forth the message, working together for the common good. I have some connection to Abraham. Maybe, uh, maybe I'm biased, but we, we think it turned out all right. Well, I hope it did. Thank you, Grandfather. You're welcome. Now we snap the fingers and you all wake up. <laughs> These are so now a few introductions permit me. Um, how many of you here are Doan descendants? Put up your hand. Wonderful. Hi there, cousins. Um, I'd like to thank Melissa Vella from the temple over there, standing by the post, who helped us organize this event. Is, is there somebody from the Ontario Genealogical Society here? Megan? Maybe she's... How about the York Pioneers? Too shy? Um, I think someone from the New Newmarket Historical Association, Robert Buckman, is here. Where's Robert? There he is, over under the tree. We have um, two councillors from East Gwillimbury, Terry Foster and Kathy Martin. Please give us a wave. One, two of you. Great. Thank you very much for coming. It's a beautiful... I'd like to introduce the people from the Sharon Burying Ground. If you have not looked at the Sharon Burying Ground on Facebook, you ought to. It's a lovely site, full of vignettes, not only about the occupants of the Burying Ground, which is are all children of peace, but uh, Ontario history. Tara Downing, past president. Where is Tara? And Karen. Mah Mahoney, Mahoney in the back there. There's Karen. So, so la uh, last but not least, the, the president of the Sharon Temple Museum Society. Uh, but that's not the best part about this person. The president of the Sharon Temple Museum Society is also a direct descendant of David Wilson, spiritual founder uh, and leader of the Children of Peace, Jim Pearson. So our great, great, greats, we're friends. That's right. And now we're friends. How great is that? Um, we have, um, I have a little present for you, Jim. I think I put him, I put him to a lot of work. He had to, uh, a lot of this comes from this man's memory, but we also had to confirm facts and that took a bit of work. And I'm, I felt that maybe you were feeling a little peaked after all that work. So I brought you a, a tincture of quinine. <laughs> <laughs> It'll make you feel better. Um, so the, there are people waiting for you on the way out of town, just up the road here at the Sharon Burying Ground. We hope that you'll stop. They are waiting to answer your questions. Please stop in for a couple minutes. It's an amazing little place. And one more thing before you go, and I don't mean to frighten you, but a recent ultrasound of the ground discovered 50 bodies in the cemetery for which there are no markers. So walk softly because the children are sleeping. Thank you.